Hi, this is Justin and welcome to Simple Believer TV. This channel is for those who desire to better understand who God is, who they are to God, and how to walk out this Christian life. I'm here to simplify the scriptures to better help you run the race that God has called you to run. So thank you for being a part of this community. Thank you for subscribing. Enjoy today's teaching. Big on my heart this morning. Uh, this idea of relating with God as a pastor, as someone who's been in the ministry for almost 21 years or 20 years now, um, I've watched people struggle to relate with God. They've struggled to enjoy God. They've struggled to uh, have a relationship that is thriving with God. It's been one that is all, oftentimes up and down. It's been one that has been broken and people feel as though it's not where it needs to be. It's not right. And so they live with this constant non-reassurance or non-assurance of where they are with God. And as I was just praying for our service this morning and just spending some time in the scriptures this morning, a verse that came back to my memory was Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Now, I really want to encourage you, if you ever have a chance, read the entire passage, the entire chapter of Matthew 11, and I think you'll better understand what Jesus was inviting us into. But he says these words in verse number 28. He says, come to me. That that speaks so loudly of relationship. He said, come to me, come to me. And, and I know that in times of difficulty, we, we find it maybe easier to come to him. But when we sin, when we fail, when we mess up, when things are going well and there's a goodness of, or, or, or abundance of goodness that's happening in our life, we struggle at times to come to him. And he said these words, come to me, all who, you, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. First and foremost, what Jesus is speaking to us here is this idea that we all carry or have carried a burden or a backpack of, backpack of sin prior to Christ. And so what he's doing is he's inviting all humanity to come to him to be released of this burden of sin. But over time, I've watched believers who have given up their sin. And what I mean by that is they've given up their old life and they've embraced Christ in this new life, but they've put on a different backpack. They live with a different weight, a weight that actually um, is heavy and that actually uh, brings them down, that is hard to carry. And so this life that they're living as a Christian, many times I hear the words of, man, this is hard. Man, I struggle. Man, I, I don't know how to engage with God. Man, I feel like God maybe is just overly disappointed with me. And so they live with this weight that they picked up themselves. They put on a backpack after Jesus said, come to me, all who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. They receive the initial rest from the wrath of God, from, from eternity and hell, and they've received a relationship with God only to find a few moments later. And that's why salvation is one of the most joyous events of anybody's life because they finally feel oh, the weight has been lifted. But then as we get into churches and maybe around different ministers, around different brothers and sisters, we start adding weights to our backpack that bring us down and they make this relationship with God hard and arduous and difficult and challenging. And brothers and sisters, that ought not to be. You ought to be the most free, joyful, enjoying the relationship with God people that anybody would ever, ever encounter. That when they encounter you, they should be able to encounter the result of you enjoying God, not you going, oh, I don't know where I'm at with God. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying because Jesus was giving us a, 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 a look or a insight into what this relationship should look like. And he said these words in verse 29. He said, take my yoke upon you, not yours, not somebody else's, not religion, not what your pastor says to put upon you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Again, it speaks to relationship that we are disciples 
of Christ. You are not a disciple of Justin. You are not a disciple of New Day. You are not a disciple of some other church. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Oh, let me just help somebody mute. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ alone. And he says, come and learn from me for I am gentle. One of the things I've come to love about Jesus, and I just pray that he consistently upgrades me in this area, is that of gentleness. And he says, I am lowly or humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke, listen to these words, my yoke is easy. <laughs> he said, take my yoke upon you. And he says, at, just in verse 30, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you ever feel a weight, realize this, it did not come from Jesus. If you ever feel a, a, a pressure to perform, a, a pressure to strive to earn, if you ever feel like you aren't good enough, you don't feel like I, you, you've been accepted by God, or if you feel like you're about to be rejected, realize this, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now, I want to encourage you, whatever backpack you're wearing, the backpack that religion will put on you, and that's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He says, you are making your disciples seven sons the, of hell more than you are. You guys are, you guys are burdening them with these commandments and these regulations and these obligations. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I want to highly encourage you, come to Jesus, learn from him, take upon his yoke and his burden for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It is a free life that we get to live in Christ. Free for what? Free to live with him, free to allow him to live through us. It's not about man. Will I make him happy today? Will I, will I do, have all my ducks in a row today? That is not the goal of Christianity. The goal of Christianity is to relate to Jesus and allow him to live his life through you so that we can impact a world that desperately needs the power of God. And so, as I mentioned last week, I want to just go through a brief uh, review of what we kind of mentioned last week, because I, I feel like it's important to kind of plant those seeds again is what you think about God is probably the most important thought that you're ever going to have in this world. Throughout the course of your life, one of the most impactful thoughts that you'll ever have is, what do I think about God? Do I think about him rightly from the scriptures? And many people have a perception of God based upon their own personal daddy, based upon their issues in their past, based upon what religion has told them, based upon what somebody else has maybe spoken to them about God. And so they have this idea of God that could be either distorted or undeveloped. A distorted view of God requires us to see it through, to see God rightly from his perspective and from his word. An undeveloped view of God means that I consistently can grow in discovering who God is, who he truly is inside of our life. And as I mentioned before, God longs to have a relationship with you and with me personally. Yes, of course, as a community, as a body of Christ, he wants a relationship with his body so that we can move in unison and unity with no division and we can accomplish his will and we can accomplish the things that he has for us. But individually, he longs to have a relationship with each of us. But why? And as I was thinking about this, I wanted to put this out there because I feel like when we understand why he's relating with us and how he is relating with us, we can also then better understand how I can relate with him just as well. And so he wants to affirm in this relationship, he, we, he wants to affirm that we are his. He wants us to know you are mine, Justin, and you are my beloved, Justin. And I've accepted you in the beloved, Justin. And I've made you a new creation, creation, Justin. And so he is constantly by the spirit of God affirming that I am his. He's not affirming me. He's not affirming my behavior. He's not affirming 
Justin, you're a good boy. Justin, you got this today. He's not doing that kind of affirmation. He's affirming, Justin, you are mine. Be secure in the fact that you are mine. The second thing that comes out of this relationship is that he longs for us to continually discover who he is. Not only does he want to affirm that I am his, but he says, Justin, I'm inviting you now to discover who I am. And there's a depth to him that we'll never reach. There's a, there's a, a, a vastness and a majestic nature of his that we'll never fully understand, but we can constantly always explore. And so that's why when I go to my time and I read the Bible, it's not just to get knowledge about him. It's not just to read historically about Jesus. I want to know this God that he has invited me on a personal level to know him. And I want to discover who are you, God? Who are you to me? Who do you want to be for my family? Who do you want to be for the world? Who do you want to be for the nation during a trying time that we're facing? God, who are you? And then I begin to discover different facets I, I began to discover different facets of who God is. And then I begin to see, as I begin to discover these things, that I start to embrace who he is, and intimacy starts to arise in my life. And the last thing I put here is as why we relate with God is that he wants to mold us. Ryan and Nikki, Angel, Ray, Jessica, he wants to mold us into his people who represent him and his heart wherever he sends us. He has an assignment for all of us, and he wants to be, us to be molded by him so that we can represent him as sons and daughters wherever we go. We are called to be the lights of this dark world. And so Jesus came to show us the Father. Jesus came to bring us back to the Father, and Jesus came to make things right between us and the Father. Now, the reason why I repeat those things that I shared last week is because if we do not realize that Jesus made it right between us and God, we are going to constantly be trying to make things right between us and God, thinking that if I just fix this in my life, if I just get this thought process right in my life, if I just get this where it needs to be and I get a solid prayer life and a solid study life and I start to really pursue God each and every morning, man, me and God will be better. And I've often asked people this question. Of course, to me, it's a, it's a trick question, but I, it's really insightful for me when I get the answers is I ask people, how are you and God, specifically Christians? How are you and God? And most often, 99.9% .9 of the time, they answer me with this simple answer either good because of how they've acted this week or bad because of their shortcomings. And so they measure their relationship with God based upon them and not based upon what Jesus did for them. Can you imagine what that looks like? I'm sure you've experienced the internal unsettling nature of not knowing where you and God stand. Are we good? Are we not good? And then you feel like you're better because you started to pray or you went to church or you started to give and you felt like you experience God in those moments. But at the end of the day, if we base us and God based upon us, we will always be insecure in our relationship with God. Now, the reason why I'm sharing all of these things in the beginning is to just set us up so that we can relate with God effectively, so that I can actually enjoy the God that enjoys me. I am his son whom he deeply loves. And because of that, I now want to freely relate with him just as well. And so disposition and attitude are the keys to relating with God. How I posture. Do I posture as a son or do I posture as an unworthy orphan or unworthy sinner? Do I posture as one that is um, believing what Jesus did for me? Do I posture as one of going, God, I'm, I'm just not, I don't deserve what you have for me. I'm just no good God. And I just, I'm just, God, I just want to be humble and un let you know I'm so undeserving. And what happens is our posture becomes one of not receiving. We actually start to receive what we think we deserve from our past and our disposition and our attitude matter greatly. And so we are to posture with God as receivers all the time.
that I'm constantly learning how to receive from my father. And so I want to quickly go through what we had mentioned last week. I won't expound on any of them. I just want to put them out there if you're taking notes or if somebody's typing in the comment section. But we are to relate to God without fear. Hold on one second. Let me help somebody mute. All right. We are to relate to God without fear of future punishment. That's first and foremost. If we're going to relate to God, we relate to God without fear of punishment. Yes, he disciplines, but punishment is the wrath that's to come. And as a son, I am now free from the wrath that's to come. Secondly, we are to relate to God as our father, not our judge. And the simple illustration I gave you is if your dad was a Supreme Court judge and you were of a smaller age in life of three to seven years old, would you treat him as a judge when he came home or would you run into his arms and say, daddy? And so we can now relate to God as a father, not just as a judge that one day is going to judge mankind. The third thing that we mentioned last week is we are to relate to God knowing who we once were. We don't forget that. We don't deny it. We're not trying to ignore it, but we're embracing who we now are in Christ. God relates to me based upon who I am in Christ, not who I used to be and what I should go back and change. Number four that we talked about last week is we are to relate to God as sons and not orphans. If you ever find an orphan mindset creep within you that says you're not deserving, you, uh, you don't belong in the family of God, you're just not like the other kids in the, in the family of God, that's part of an orphan way of thinking. You must actually pull down that stronghold, pull down those thoughts with the word of God and remind yourself, I'm a son of God and he loves me. And I'm secure in who I am with him and who he is becoming to me. The fifth thing that we mentioned last week is we are to relate to God as desperately needing his power, not to just check off something on our list. Don't go and meet with God just because that's the right thing to do and this is the Christian thing to do. No, we need his power. Why? Because that power has to work through us so that we can see God's fruit in his kingdom advance on this earth. I desperately need his power. It's one of the things right now that he's inviting me more deeply into is a lifestyle where I can experience and live the power of God. Uh, the sixth thing is we are to relate to God so that we have something to offer the world. They don't need a better version of Justin. They need God living in Justin. They need the Christ that lives in Justin to go and to be what I've been called to be. And so let me just continue that thought process this morning. I want to continue to talk about how, to, how we relate to God. And my prayer is that as we go through these thoughts, that you will begin to better understand what this relationship can look like and how you can have a relationship with God that never changes up and down, up and down, that you can always find a place of joy and peace with God. The first one is this, is we are to relate to God on the basis of faith and not our feelings. This whole relationship with God is on the basis of my faith in God, in his word, in Christ and what he has done. It's not based on my feelings. Emotions are fine, but they do not tell you the full story or the truth of a particular situation. How many have been there before? You felt a certain way. You felt like, man, God has forgotten you. He's forsaken you. You felt like somebody did something that they shouldn't have done toward you only to find in the end, oh, wow, God was actually working something out. I'm reminded of a story of Mike and Jess where there was a job that she was after. Mike really wanted her to have the job. She didn't get the job, but that particular job, a whole bunch of people got laid off and he looked back on it and he goes, man, I'm so thankful that we got what God wanted and not what I wanted. And many times our emotions can get mixed into our relationship with God and they can take us on this roller coaster ride of wondering where we are with God and how we are doing with God. And so we live in a society that is, I feel, therefore I am. And I just want to exhort you as brothers and sisters in Christ, don't define yourself by how you feel. 
Don't just believe I'm depressed because you feel depressed or I'm discouraged because you feel discouraged or I'm just angry and hateful because you have those emotions. Those emotions do not have to define you. They're not wrong to have. They can be dangerous at times if they're not allowed to be in their proper place. If they have mastery over you, of course, then you become a, a, a victim of those emotions. But I want to encourage you to define yourself according to what God said and not according to what your emotions are screaming. And so what is a lifestyle of faith? If we are to relate to God based upon faith and not feelings, what is a life of faith? Because I'm not encouraging you to conform to a mold or to follow some script or everybody let's be like each other. No, we all have our own personalities. We all have our own way of being made up by God. But what is faith? To me, a simple understanding of faith is this. I respond to who God is. I respond out. to what he has written. Hold on one second. And I respond to what Jesus has done for me. So I respond to who God is. I respond to what he has written. And I respond to what Jesus has done for me. So you take any circumstance that you may face or any challenge that you're going through or a challenging person, or maybe some of you had just received bad news. You know, I know recently a, a lady in our community named June, you all know her, you know her is probably one of the most joyful people that you've ever met. She received challenging news a couple of weeks ago. And it's as our part, we become empathetic and sympathetic for the things that she faces off with. Of course, every person has their own challenges and fight. But what is faith when it comes to our situations that we face off with challenging news like that? Is I'm to respond to who God is. God, who are you? You are always good. You always have my best in mind. You're always setting me up to succeed. So, Father, I'm going to respond to your goodness more than I'm going to respond to the bad news that I received from a doctor who's doing his job but doesn't have the full of truth in his abilities. God, you see what he can't see. You can do what he cannot do. And then I respond to God, what did you say in your word? There's many promises in God's word that I can begin to respond to. And then Jesus, what did you do for me? And I start to live a life of faith that way. I start to now respond. Remember, faith is always responsive. I am always responding to God. I'm responding either to who he is to what he said or to what Jesus has done for me 24 hours a day. The moment I make it transactive, the moment I make it, I do this and God, you'll do this. You now put that pressure and that weight back upon you. And you now have to live up to that expectation or standard of saying, God, if I do this, then you'll do. And we start to now make deals with God. God, I'll give you my life. God, I'm totally, I totally repent. God, I, I, I totally will pray more. God, I will totally give up playing on that um, video game system or I'll totally stop watching that, God, if you'll just do this. God, if you just help me through this process that we're, 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 we're battling through, I totally will do that. And we make these promises. So we transact with God, not realizing we can't live up to the end of the bargain. And so a lifestyle of faith is what? Responding to him. If you're going to relate to God and actually enjoy this relationship with God, we have to learn how to respond to him. I wanted to take a look at this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's actually verses 1 through 7. And the reason why I want to read this whole thing is because verse number 7 is something that is often quoted. I've quoted it in my entire life, but I've never quoted verses one through six. And I want you to see in context this verse seven, how it relates to our relationship with God. Second Corinthians 5, 1 says this, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, thinking about our bodies, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. Verse 3, 
if indeed we have been clothed, we shall also not, or shall we not be found naked? For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us a spirit as a guarantee. A guarantee of what? A future with him in eternity. So we also are confident knowing that while we are at home in this body, we're absent from the Lord. And look at verse seven, a familiar passage. For we walk by faith and not by sight. You know, that verse is often spoken of and puts pressure on people to transact with God. Hey, you walk by faith and God will do this. Hey, if you walk by faith, God will do this. And I'm saying to you, no, just respond. A lifestyle of faith is responding, God, who are you to me? Who are you? God, what have you said in your word? And God, what did Jesus do for me on that cross 2,000 years ago? And now I respond, and I respond, and I respond. So we walk by faith, responding to God, not by what I see. I know that in this body, I will have tribulations and trials and challenges but I walk by faith, not denying those things. I walk by faith knowing there comes a day where there will be no challenges and no tribulations and no trials because I'll be spending eternity with my father. So I respond to that perspective that I am in this body for just a moment, but I'll be, in turn, I'll be with the father for eternity in time to come. And I respond to that. The second thing that we, how we to relate to God is we are to relate to God with expectation of his goodness. If there's one thing that I would encourage more believers to do is wake up with expectation. Some of you wake up with, oh man, I hope nothing goes bad today. You fear bad news. You fear what it's going to be like. And you start to live your life timid and you live your life trying not to have bad things happen. And your prayers are timid. And your prayers are trying to say, God, thank you for your goodness and your blessing, but there's so little. What about if we said, God, expand my mind to expect bigger things from you? What if we started to believe for the miraculous? What if we started to believe like the, 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 the prayer lady sitting right there on the couch with, with George? What if we started to believe that revival is possible? What if we started to believe that God could pour out his spirit upon a nation and upon a, a country or upon, upon the world? What if we started to believe that God could actually reignite a, a passion for him inside of our families? What if we woke up expecting, God, I can't wait to see what you're up to inside of my life? What if we got bad news and we started to be man, God, you're up to something. I know it because if I got bad news that the enemy's trying to discourage me, you're up to something good inside of my life. And I can't wait to see how you turn this thing around. And we start to ask questions like, God, what are you up to? God, thank you for producing goodness out of this pain and out of this chaos. God, I believe that you are good no matter what I face. Help me to see your goodness. And what if we started to live with the mindset that David spoke of in Psalms 23, verse 6, when he says, surely goodness and mercy and favor shall follow me all the days of my life. New Day, I pray that you will begin to live with expectation. Not so, Many of us don't because we're fearful of being disappointed. Man, there are so many good promises in the scriptures that God, I expect goodness to happen in my life. Lord, I expect that you are going to talk to me today. Father, I expect that your mercies will overwhelm me today. Your grace will sustain me today. And we start to live with expectation. I start to expect that the Holy Spirit is going to start molding me, informing me, and I'm going to expect miracles to take place. And I'm going to start to expect that God will redeem the time where I feel like time was stolen from me. And so maybe in our discussion, right when we're done with those people that you're sitting next to or you're with in your house, maybe you could just share with them something that you're expecting or that you've actually put aside and you stopped expecting because you just didn't see it happening. Another one about how to relate to God, I just have a few more, is we relate to God through his word. 
and not what someone else told us or what we think he said. Church, I really want to encourage you. Live with this inside your mind and your heart. Don't, don't just be craving experiences with God outside of God. Will you talk to me through your word? Will you reveal yourself to me through your word? And as you open up the Bible, allow the Holy Spirit to reveal who God is to you through the scriptures. In this day and age, even more so, we must go back to the surest thing that we know and have in our possessions, which is the written word of God. First Corinthians chapter four, verse six, you guys can read the passages before when you have time, but it says something very interesting. It says, now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. This is the level, level playing field right here. Let us not think beyond what is written. Allow ourselves to be in a parameter of the scriptures and then allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate and, and enlighten the scriptures to our understanding. So we are to relate to God through his word first and foremost, not just what someone else said or what we think that God may be said about us. There are many great platitudes and principles that we have on um, wall hangings and we have on little things, uh, trinkets in our bathrooms. All those are great quotes. All those are great sayings. But at the end of the day, I want to know, God, what have you said in your word? We are to relate to God through prayer and not worry. Now, I know you know this. I know that what I'm sharing with you is not like, holy cow, it's amazing. But we are to relate to God through prayer and not worry. If you were hungry and you went to a restaurant and you ate food, you're confident that you're going to leave with no hunger pains anymore. Why? Because you actually satisfied the hunger by eating food. Prayer is the same way. I've watched many people, myself included at times, go into the presence of God or into a, a meeting like this or a church like this, worrying about something. And they left with the same worry. What that tells me is it's just like somebody who is hungry. They ran into the restaurant, they ordered the food, but they never ate it. And they came out and they said, man, I'm so hungry. If you come out of a time in a presence of God or a time of reading the word of God and you're still worried, it's because you didn't relate with God through prayer. You related with God through worry. You actually talked to him about the problem. You didn't talk to him about changing your perspective about the problem. And so I don't bring my problems to God per se. I bring me to God and I ask him to change me so that I can see that problem the same way that he sees the problem because he's not worried about it. And there must be a reason that he's not worried about it. If he's not worried about that doctor's report, why am I? And then we come in these understandings. And this is why the point before this was so important. We relate to God through the word. Many times we relate to God in our basis of what we think God may be. Oh, no, no, God is okay with me worrying because I'm worrying because this is important or this is, you should worry about this. And I'm saying to you, you don't have to live a life of worry. That can be broken off in your life. Worrying is just simply carrying a weight regarding the future or an outcome of something that doesn't belong to you. You were never designed to worry. We are not designed to worry. It crushes our spirit. It, it zaps us of any hope and joy, and it begins to choke the word of God that is trying to bear fruit in our life. So worry is not acceptable as believers. It's deadly. And a care is simply this. A care means it is something that draws or divides my mind. That I know God said this, but the doctor said this. So now I'm divided. Which one will I believe? And that's why it goes back to we relate to God through faith and not our feelings. So I hope that you can see how all of these things tie together as I'm talking to you, because as I relate to God, I want to be free to what? Pray. 
My prayer language is not about my problems. Many times we have problems or circumstances or a negative person in our life, and we go to God and we want him to change this so that I could be happier. My prayer language or my prayer time is not about me becoming more happy. My prayer time is about me experiencing and knowing him and him helping me to see life according to his perspective. So when I walk out of that time, when I spend time with God, I walk out a different person. I walk out with a different lens. You cannot, and this is why you cannot hold on to or carry cares in your life. There are some of you who have let, not let go of a care of what somebody did to you, of what the future holds, about your financial situation, about the medical situation of a loved one. And so you hold deeply onto it, not willing to let it go because you don't trust that God actually cares about that more than you do. And so worry leads us to become double-minded. And James tells us when we are double-minded, we are unstable in all of our ways. I'm just going to run through these passages. There's a whole bunch here, and I'm not going to read them all, but just listen to these words. 2 Corinthians 13, 7. Now I pray to God that you do no evil. 2 Corinthians 13, 9. For we are glad that when we are weak and you are strong, this also we pray that you may be complete. Philippians 1, 9. And this I pray. Pray that your love may abound. Colossians 1 9. For this reason, also since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you. 1 Thessalonians 5 17. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5 25. 5 25. Brethren, pray for us. 2 Thessalonians 1 11. Therefore, we also pray always for you. Intercession is not just what the prayer ladies are assigned to do, we are to pray for each other. When you're on a phone with somebody, don't neglect to go, man, can I pray for you? Don't stop praying for your spouse. Don't stop praying for your kids at night. Use this avenue of prayer, not to make lives better, but to actually engage with the Father so that any worry and any fear is no longer part of the equation. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.8, 2, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere. Hebrews 13.8, pray for us. James 5.13, if anyone is among you, let him pray. James 5.14, if anyone among you, among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. James 5.16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. 1 John 5.16, if anyone sees his brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give a life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death, and I do not say that he should pray about that. Third John 2, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health. So there is an importance when it comes to prayer, that we are to relate to God through prayer and not worry. It is one thing to say, God, here's what I'm struggling with. But at the end of the day, 1 Peter 5, verse number 7 says, cast your care on God. Because if you don't, you'll pile one care and then you'll pile another one and then you'll pile another one. And eventually you'll be like, I just can't do this anymore. I just can't believe anymore. I'm losing faith in God's goodness. Why? Because you never casted your care in the first place. And some of you are holding on to a care that does not belong to you. The only person that can handle it is God. And lastly, let me finish off with this. We are to relate to God knowing he cares about the details of our life, even the little ones. If there's anything that speaks to the personal relationship of our father is he cares about every detail of your life every detail if it matters to you it matters to god if it's important to you it is important to god and what i mean by that is he cares about the details of what you're facing off with of what you're going through of what you're believing for he cares about those things and there's a passage in um, psalms 37 23 no, and 24 yeah. no. and this is from the uh, amplified version, it says this, the steps of a good man 
are directed by and established by the Lord when he delights in his way or in, by the Lord when he delights in his way and he busies himself with his every step. And I want to encourage you with this. The Lord delights in, in, in looking after all of us. He adopted us. And when you adopt somebody, you take the responsibility of providing for that son or for that daughter. You take on the responsibility of caring for that son or daughter. So don't think he just adopted us and goes, man, why did I make that decision? No, he knows what he's doing. He's adopting us into his family. And he's saying, I will take care of you. Remember the prodigal son, when he came back, the father threw a robe on him put a ring on him, put sandals on his feet and brought a fetid calf out. He was signifying my son was dead, but now he's alive. He is my son and I will care for him. And I will affirm to him that he is mine. And so God wants to take care of every area of your life, even the smallest detail. He loves you so much that he knows the number of hairs that you have on your head. If you think about detail, there is almost nothing more detailed than knowing the numbers of hairs on her head. In fact, he says he's numbered the hairs on her head. And if your loving father knows and is interested in the small details of your life, then you don't have to be overcome by any problem that you are facing today. So I pray that we will learn how to relate to God effectively so that we can actually relate to him with joy and peace and security. And so I want to share my screen briefly. Let me see if I can do this. Let me exit out of here. I'm going to share my screen and I want us to ask this question um, this morning, if we can do that. Let me get, let me get to it. Hold on. Here it is. And I just want you to ask this question either to, to God or to those who are with you for just a moment. And while Ryan and Nikki sing this final song um, and we just do one final or one, one worship song, I want this question to be something that you uh, take a moment and think about and maybe share it with those who are sitting right next to you is what care have you been having a difficult time casting on God? Be open and then maybe right at that place, you can cast that care right now and today. And I would love for you, when we're done worshiping this final song, throw it on the chat section or when I do a little roll call when we say goodbye, maybe you can share the one care that you've been struggling to cast onto God. And we can pray for each other just now. So Ryan, go ahead and uh, go ahead and.